not the greatest song. I, I just, you just don't know. You don't know where I was and what I was going through and how God would use that song in my life, in my heart, um, to just encourage me. Now, hope you've got your copy of God's Word. Uh, I want you to look. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, if you remember, back in February, we went over the first part of chapter 3. So now we're going to come to chapter 3, verse 8. Uh, so uh, if you need to go back and catch all of that before, you can do that. And I'm going to start with a story from one of my favorite people of all time, Dr. Howard Hendricks. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Dr. Hendricks. He was the great, long-tenured professor at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, became a good friend, a mentor uh, to me. The times that I had with him, I just cherished him. And right before he uh, passed away and went on to glory, I had the opportunity to honor him with the Lindsay Award and uh, give that to him. At that point in his life, he, he could not even speak. Um, but uh, he was such an incredible blessing. And he told a story. I love this story that Dr. Hendricks used to tell. He would tell the story of uh, the Zippy Food Company. Now, I may have shared this before, probably not with you, but I've uh, shared this a number of times. The Zippy Food Dog Company, you know, was holding its annual meeting, its yearly meeting. They had all of their sale force there. They were gathered together in a Hilton ballroom uh, in Atlanta. And the president of the Zippy Dog Food Company comes out, and he's going to, he's going to just, you know, lead the cheer for the Zippy Dog Food Company. And so he begins to cheer. Who's got the best dog food in the world? And all the sale for it, they jump to their feet. We do, we do, we do. And then he says, who's got the best sales force of any company in America? And of course, they jump up. We do, we do, we do. And then he just hollers out again and he says, listen, who's got the best marketing campaign, the best media group in all of the country? And they all shout out, we do, we do. And then he hollers out and he says, well, why are we number 17 out of 18 dog food companies in America? <laughs> and there's one new guy. There's always a new guy in the, in the whole, well, the whole place falls deathly quiet. And the one new guy in the back jumps up and he hollers out because the dogs hate it. <laughs> now, Dr. Hendricks used that as a parody of the church. The pastor comes... Who's got the best facilities in the world? We do. Who's got the best music in the world? We do. Who's got the best instrumentalists in the world? We do. Who's got the best staff in the world? We do. Then why don't the people come? Because they don't like us. In all honesty, if the church were actually being the church, they would be lined up down the street. You ever go to Chick-fil-A at lunchtime? You ever go to chicken salad chick at lunchtime? And you come to the church. And we wonder why they aren't lined up out the door and down the driveway and into the street. Because the fact of the matter is they don't like us a whole lot. And the truth of the matter is we don't get along with each other very much. Thank you for coming today. <laughs> Welcome to Valleydale. There we are. That's exactly what Peter's going to talk about. If you've got your copy of God's Word, 1 Peter chapter 3. I want to show you what's going on. It's still connected back to chapter 2 verse 12. Uh, in chapter 2, verse 12, Peter says something, and he follows that out all the way through uh, to chapter 3, verse 12. And he talks about this. He says, you need to have excellent behavior. You need to have excellent behavior. And he says, I'm not going to let you off with that. I'm going to tell you the difficult places where you're to have excellent behavior. Number one, in how you treat people in authority. 
how you treat the president, how you treat the governor, how you treat the police officer, how you treat a, a parent, how you treat a preacher, all the way down to the crossing guard, even if it's Barney Fife. You treat them with respect and with honor. He says that's where you hold your behavior excellent. That's where you have excellent behavior because the world's watching you. Then he comes and he says the second place is when it comes to your boss, the person that you're working for. We looked at that last week. Thank the Lord those two passages are behind us. They were hard, hard to preach, hard probably to listen to as well. Uh, but these people in this passage could not leave their job like you can. Uh, they could not walk off the job. They were, in essence, slaves, uh, and yet they were struggling with their masters. And so he comes and he says, let me tell you how you respond to those that are in authority above you in a place of work. Then he comes and he talks about this very thing in marriage. Because let me tell you something, your marriage is scrutinized by people around you. They watch your marriage. They watch you in relationship to your wife or to your husband. And he says that in this place, you have a great opportunity to show the love of Jesus Christ, to treat each other. So when it comes to your marriage, you have your behavior is excellent before the watching world. In how I treat my wife, in how I care for my children, every bit of that speaks of a witness for Jesus Christ. Now he's going to come to the last part, the last thing. In fact, if you've got your Bibles open there in verse 8, look at what he says to sum up. Telios is the word. That means now finally or the end. It's the end of this section. It's not the end of what he wants to say, but it's the end of this section dealing with your behavior. And he comes and he's going to deal with our behavior with each other and with the world and our attitude and behavior toward God. Now, those are the three movements in those few verses, verse 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Those are the, that's the three areas that he's going to discuss. And uh, I, want you to, I want you to see this. He's writing to hurting people. I've told you this scores of time, hurting people hurt people. When people are hurting, when they are under great stress and anxiety, when they've been hurt, when they've been uh, rejected, when they've been embarrassed, when they have been uh, slighted, when they have been ridiculed in some kind of way, we almost always lash back out toward other people. It affects our attitude. Well, he's writing people who are being persecuted by the government. He's writing people who are being persecuted by their own families, their friends. He's writing to people who have been rejected and ostracized and turned away, who are losing property. Some of them are losing their freedoms. Some of them have been imprisoned. Others uh, are beginning to be put to death, all because of their relationship to Jesus Christ. And so he comes and he says, I want to tell you that your hope in Christ trans." forms your hurt into a manifestation of love for other people. Now, did you get that? That's what you call, I'm, I'm preaching, I'm teaching preaching. I'm te I am the only nut in America that's teaching at two seminaries this fall. Uh, one is here and the other is Southwestern. And I am going to tell you what I tell them. That's the sermon in a sentence right there. You need to get that. That's what this entire passage is about right here. It is about the fact that your hope in Jesus Christ, who loves you, who saved you, who's redeemed you, who keeps you, who holds you, who sustains you, your hope in Jesus Christ can transform your hurt into an expression of love toward other people. You don't have to bark back at somebody. You don't have to bite at somebody or snap at somebody. You don't have to hurt other people when you yourselves are going through hurt. 
Now, that's the word that he's giving here. And I want you to see it because it's it's very simple outline that you come to. He comes and he's going to talk, first of all, about how we treat the brethren. In the midst of hurt, how do we treat one another? How do I live with my brothers and sisters in Christ? How do I live among the brethren here at Valleydale? Well, he's going to come and he's going to give you uh, five things here. The interesting thing is this. Now watch, he's going to give five things. Four of these things, this is the only time in the entire New Testament that these words are used. Which tells me this is unique. He is saying something very unique here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He is coming and saying, these are five things, four of these Never used in the New Testament. Now, the concepts are there. The principles are there. You will notice the principles. But let me tell you, they are, they are, this is the only time these four words are used. Now, let's go to the text, verse 8. I may not get beyond verse 8, which will be okay. I have three points. But this may be as far as we get. But I want you to get this. I want you to listen to what he's saying in verse 8. He's saying this. This is how we are to live with one another. When we're in committee meetings, when we're in life groups, when we're standing in the foyer out there, when we gather for pickleball or basketball, or when we gather for whatever event on Wednesday nights, you're just milling around in the hallways. He says, this is the way you live with your brothers and sisters in Christ, even though you're suffering right now, even though you're going through a difficult, hard time right now. Verse 8, to sum up. To sum up everything that I've said about holding your behavior as excellent, all of you, do you see that? He doesn't give anybody what, he doesn't say everybody from 18 to 57. Doesn't say that. He says all of you. He doesn't say everybody that is 60 years of age and above, this is what you're to do. He says to all of you, Everybody in the family of God, everybody in the fellowship, everybody in the church. And now he begins. He says, be harmonious. Be harmonious. Now, I'm going to show you something, and this may take a a minute or two. Peter is writing against the culture that they're living in. He wants them to understand that they are to rise above the culture that they live in. That their behavior, their attitude, their thinking is to rise above what the culture is saying is the norm. Now, in that culture, the Greco-Roman culture, being harmonious was prized by the Roman Empire. You be harmonious. In other words, you agree with what the emperor says or else. So he's saying you be hard. In other words, you have to agree. Now that's not what Paul, uh, what Peter is talking about here. He's not saying that we all have to agree about everything. There's a little difference. The word there is homo phronos. Phronos Phronesse, frontal. It's the word from which you get frontal lobe, the mind. When they use that word, phronesse, they thought of the front part of your mind. This is where we think we think. That's what their idea was. This is where thinking goes on, right here. Homo is the word that means uh, same or like. And so when you put the two words together, it means we get the word like-minded. We're to be like-minded, but I want you to understand something. He's not saying we're to be like-minded in in that we agree on everything that there is. I'm trying to walk through this very carefully because in a church, we've got people that are all over the place and they're thinking about different uh, uh, Political ideologies. He's not saying that you must all agree politically, ideologically. Political ideology is not the foundation of our fellowship. The blood of Jesus Christ is. You see? 
and you think it's a political ideology that is the most important thing we can do right now. No, the most important thing about this fellowship is it's not based on Washington. It's based on Calvary. Now, listen, that just gets me excited. Uh, you don't sit there like you want to, but I'm telling you, that's an excitement. Do you see, I, it doesn't matter what we think about different various things. What matters is that the basis of our faith, we are like-minded that way. Now, let me show you two passages of Scripture. I'm going to be using a good deal of Scripture. Let me go back here to uh, 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, listen to what Paul writes there. Yet for us, there is but one God the Father, from whom all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. Then you get over here to Ephesians chapter 4 and listen to what he's saying in Ephesians chapter 4. There is one body, one spirit. We were called in one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us is given grace according to the measure of Christ Jesus. We've all been given his grace. We've all experienced. That's the oneness. We would really say it's better... Better, it translated a oneness of heart. We have a oneness of heart in that all of us are saved by Jesus Christ. We're all sinners saved and redeemed and have experienced the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ. That's the harmony. That's the basis of our fellowship right there. It's not that we all look alike, we're all the same race, we all went to the same school, we all have the same political ideology. No, the foundation of our fellowship, the harmony that we share is Jesus Christ. You see that? All this other stuff is secondary. When you bring all this other stuff up and you begin to base your fellowship with people on that, uh, you are just outside the will of the New Testament and the will of God. Let me give you the second thing, since y'all seem to enjoy that really well. Here's the second thing. Look at what he comes to. He comes to this whole thing of identification. Sympathes. That is, I feel for you in what you're going through. I have a sympathy for you in what you're experiencing. These people were experiencing all kind of rejection, all kind of persecution. Some were being persecuted more than others, uh, but they had sympathy for one another. They had a care for one another. They could identify with one another. Listen, that's what we're told in Hebrews chapter 4. If you just look back a few pages to Hebrews chapter 4, you read this great statement about Jesus Christ. Verse 10, uh, or, or um, oh, get to Hebrews, folks. Hebrews 4, and it is verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Now, let me tell you, you to, I, I've got that highlighted in my Bible. I've got it highlighted. I've got it starred. I have a high priest who sympathizes with me in my weakest, ugliest, dirtiest moments. In that he has been tempted in all things like we are, yet without sin. He can sympathize with what I'm going through. He can sympathize with the struggles in my life. Let me tell you something that I've thought about this week that I've wondered for years, I've pondered for years, and the Lord kind of gave me an answer to it this week. I wondered when God called Moses to lead his people out of the promised land, why God did not anoint him as the high priest. Why didn't God just make him high priest? He was acting in that way. He was standing between God and the people and the people in God. In so many ways, he was carrying out the things of the high priest. Why didn't God say, why didn't God come to Moses and say, Moses, you get your brother Aaron, and Aaron will be anointed as the high priest. He said, well, it was too much work. Well, he had too much work to begin with. So what's a little bit more? You know, just piling something else up on Moses wouldn't have been anything. Uh, so it wasn't that. What was it about Moses that God said, no, I'm not going to use you as high priest, but I'm going to turn to your brother Aaron. 
What was that? I'll tell you what it was. Moses grew up in the palace of Pharaoh. He was educated like a son of Pharaoh. He grew up with everything that was available to the children of Pharaoh. He grew up in that kind of lifestyle, and he could not really identify with the average Hebrew. But old Aaron had been there all along doing the two-step in the mud baths of Egypt, making brick with those slaves every single day. And he said, go get your brother Aaron because he can identify with the people. Well, do we identify with each other? When we hurt, do we rush to that hurt? When there is joy and rejoicing, do we rush to that rejoicing? Number three is intention. Look at the intention here. Back to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, he comes and he speaks here of brotherly love. Here is the intention that I love you from the deepest level in my heart. You're just not a member of Valleydale. You are my brothers and my sisters in Jesus Christ. That is different than having my name on the roll that you have your name on. It is at the deepest level you and I share a connection, and that connection is the blood of Jesus Christ. Let me give you the fourth thing, compassion. Look at what is said here. It uses an interesting word, kind-hearted. That kind-hearted doesn't mean just an emotion. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about this feeling that is deep down inside of me about you. It's not just a passing emotion. It is a love. There is the brotherly love. Here comes the kind heart. It kind of gets both sides. There is this kind heartedness. I feel deeply about you. You matter to me. Do y'all feel that way about each other? I'm just asking you. Or do you just kind of waltz in here, pick out your seat, sit, and then waltz out, and you speak to maybe two people the entire time you've been here? Is there any kind heartedness here? Do you realize God brought you into this fellowship for a purpose and it's not just to occupy a chair? That he wants you to be kind hearted to one another. He wants you to be brotherly to one another, to love each other and brotherly love, sisterly love, to be sympathetic and to be harmonious. And then look at the final thing that he comes up on right here. It, it's a word that kind of it conveys the idea of submission. That has run through this entire thing. There is this submission that is here. Now, I'm going to give you the word in the Greek. It's ta, uh, ta peno pe, pethos. Ta peno pethos. Phronos. It also uses the word phronos, frontal. But it uses the word humble in front of it. Ta pethos. Ta pethos. Phronos. It's the same as the first word, the root is. Where the first word is like-minded, this is humility of mind. The humility of mind says this. This is how I deal with my brothers in Christ. In fact, just look over a page. It is in my Bible to chapter 5 of 1 Peter. And listen to what he says in verse 5. It's kind of interesting that he comes back to this very word in verse 5. You younger men, now he's talking to the younger men, likewise be subject to your elders. That is, hey, th there is to be a respect for older people. There is to be a, a, a deference toward older people. You should respect and honor older people. Good Lord, somebody ought to say amen. amen. Good night. And all of you clothe yourself with humility. There's the word toward one another. Do you see that? You have this humility of mind toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Listen to what Paul says. I love this back in chapter 12 of Romans. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For through the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, 
but to think so as to have sound judgment. Do you realize what he just said? When you have haughty mind, you cannot have good judgment. When you're constantly running around thinking that you are always right, most likely you are wrong. <laughs> the two don't go together. But to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allowed it, allotted to each a measure of faith. He comes back now in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Great, great verse. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Listen to what he says. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. No, at no point in a church should there be any one person who thinks that I'm right about every cotton-picking thing in the church, not even the preacher. We need each other, folks. Do you understand? That's why God gave you a mate. My mate balances me out so wondrously that it is a marvel to me that God gave me the woman that he gave to me. Now, look, I'm not going to say that in the next hour, so y'all don't go out here and tell her that, okay? <laughs> but I, I'm just telling you the truth. When we get to the place we think, I'm the only one that can run this thing. No, you're not. No, you're not. I'm not the only pastor you could have. I, I'm not foolish enough to think I'm the only guy that can preach to this congregation. I'm not, the, I'm not foolish enough to think I'm the only guy that can preach. Uh, God can do a lot with people we are not impressed with. So it's wrong to get in a church and to think I'm the only, I'm always right. Everybody going to listen to what I'm putting forward. Everybody ought to follow what I'm saying. Everybody ought to go along with what, because I'm the only one that can do, I'm really the only one that cares about this. No, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're not. Think less of yourself. Think more of your brothers and sisters in Christ. And let me tell you something. If, if the church would do verse 8 of 1 Peter chapter 3, we'd have to put bouncers at the door to keep them out of here. Just that right there. Be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit. Now that's how we live with each other. Let me give you how we live with a hostile world. He's going to shift now beginning in verse 9. And to the end of chapter 4, he's going to shift to this thinking. How do we live in a world that is hostile toward us and the gospel? He begins that in verse 9. He says, this is how you live with the rest of the world. Now, let me give you this quickly. I, I've, I've, I knew I would use all my time on verse 8, but here it comes. He comes and he says, personally, not returning evil for evil. I'm hurt. Somebody's hurt me. What do I do? The flesh says, you go and you get them back. I mean, we heard this over and over. If somebody comes and they hit me, I'm coming back, you know, with a knife. You come at me with a knife, I'm coming back with a gun. That's the world. That is not the people of God. That's not the church. That personally, I do not repay evil with evil. In fact, there's a great passage back in Romans chapter 12 again, verse 21, that says this, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So personally, then you come verbally when I'm attacked. When somebody says something about me, he comes in verse 9 and he says this, do not return insult for insult, but give a blessing instead. Pronounce a blessing on them instead. When they insult you, don't turn around and give them the insult back. When they belittle you, don't turn around and see how bad you can belittle them. When they come and they embarrass you verbally in front of people, don't stand there and give it back to them. Just be a blessing to them. Give them a blessing instead. Speak a blessing to them. Speak a kind word to them. 
Let me give you two things out of Proverbs. This verse has done, I have, I have had to read this verse and read this verse. My wife has had to quote this verse to me. When somebody has said something about you on Twitter or Facebook or in the church or wherever, on the internet, I've had that too. <laughs> Listen, Pro Solomon says, Proverbs 26, 4, do not answer a fool according to his folly or you will also be like him. Man, I'm telling you what, Mac Brunson has quoted that verse to Mac Brunson more times than you can imagine. Do not answer a fool according to his folly unless you be like him. You want to be a fool too? You want everybody to see you that, in that light? Well, what do I do? Listen, go back to Proverbs 15.1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. You are in control of a verbal put down when you refuse to respond in like kind, but you give a blessing instead. I'm telling you. So let me get to the last thing because my time is gone. And it's this, how do I live with God? Now watch what he says right here. Look at this, verse 10. Now this is how we live in the church, how we in the church live with the world. We don't return evil for evil or insult for insult. We're here for a blessing. God has saved us in order to be a blessing to this community. We're to be a blessing to the people who live next door to us. We're to be a blessing to the people at work. Now he comes and he says, how do we respond to God? Now listen to what he does. He quotes Psalm 34 and 35 right here. And he's talking about what you say because God hears it. Verse 10, the one who desires life to, to love and see good day. You want to have a good life? You want your week to go well? Then listen to what he says. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Why? Because God hears everything you say. He, let, let, let me let you in on something. He not only hears what you say, he knows what you're thinking right now. Number two, he sees you. Turn away from evil and do good. Uh, seek peace. He must seek peace. That's a command right there. He must seek peace. This is what I'm supposed to do. I am to seek peace and pursue it. So when somebody does something to me that's evil, I don't turn around and do evil to them. I am to seek. Listen, I'm not even just to turn around and walk away. I am to seek in some kind of way to do good to them. You say, when a preacher, that's just not natural. Right? It's supernatural. <laughs> and you do that only by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now listen to what God's going to say to you. And he says this, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. When I do this, God watches me. Uh, to have the eyes of the Lord on you means the blessing of God. It conveys the blessing of God. And his ears attend to their prayers. You want God to hear your prayers? And this is the way you behave. This is what you do. This is how you live. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Listen, Isaiah got that. In Isaiah chapter 59, he talks about that very thing to Israel. But your iniquities have made separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. He doesn't bless you, his eyes aren't on you, and he doesn't hear your prayers when you pray. Why? Because I'm running my mouth at somebody or because I'm returning evil for evil. Somebody's done something to me, I'm going to pay them back. But he says, when you do this, God hears your prayers and God sees your face and it's the blessing of God. Now, this is a word to the church about how we treat each other. God will never honor and bless a life or a church that is constantly at somebody else's throat. Folks, let me tell you something. This is as practical as you can get right here. We're not to be, we're not to be marked that way. We're to hold our excellent. Our behavior is excellent. I had lunch, I had breakfast this week with a um, Young guy, he's younger than me. He's, I think he's in his mid-40s or maybe a little older. Great guy. 
He told me the other morning at breakfast, I really did not realize this. He said, I was saved one Sunday morning while you were preaching. He says, it was under your preaching that God saved me. And uh, I think I baptized him. Uh, I think I did. I, I don't remember. But um, uh, he is an investigator. And he is an incredibly sharp investigator. Insurance companies all over the place and uh, organizations all over the place hire this guy to go and investigate. And um, he felt called to the ministry. I remember talking to him, uh, having lunch with him, talking to him. Well, God called him to ministry. I ordained him and I hired him. I put him out at our South Campus, just like Josh is going down here to the, the church at Old Town. I put this guy, he was not the pastor, the campus pastor there, but he went out there as the second in charge. He handled everything else. Very organized, very committed, sharp guy. Um, left that world of investigation to enter into the world of ministry. His wife has a ministry. Now, she is as cute as she can be, but do you know what his wife's ministry is? She ministers to strippers. Now, that's her ministry. She's been in every strip joint in Jacksonville, Florida. They know her when she comes. They see her coming. They open the door. All, all the guys, the bouncers, the men that run that thing, they know she's there and she ministers to these girls. And she's led a number of them to the Lord. And she has led and helped a number of those girls to get out of that lifestyle. But do you know what she'll tell you, the number one reason why they go into stripping? Now, that's a curiosity. Um, why would you do this? Why would you go and put your body on display for every despicable somebody to sit there and to gawk at you? Well, you say, well, it's good money. It, it is good money from what I understand. It's good money, fast money. You can get it. They're addicted. Well, they've got a drug habit, and this is the place where they can get that habit satisfied all the time. Um, it's a place where they can get the attention they want. They're hungry for attention. They're wanting somebody to pay them attention. Uh, what are they looking for? Why do they go into this? Do you know the number one reason she said that young girls go into stripping? She said they are looking for a family. A family. And they think that within that circle of girls they will find what they have missed all their lives, and that is a harmony and compassion and kindness and tenderness and uh, understanding in all the things that Peter says the church is supposed to be. There's a world out there, folks, and you know what they're looking for? Family. Family. And we should be doing that in such a way that word gets out. That's where you want to go. Let's stand. All of us standing, our heads bowed. Let me tell you something. Most every one of you came here hungry for family. You were looking for family. Maybe you'd gotten under conviction about your sin, but you were looking for somebody that would take you in would share with you about a Savior that could forgive your sins, who would accept you just like you are, who would pour themselves into you and love on you and uh, put their arms around you and be kind to you and sympathetic, understand how you feel. You were looking for that. Some of you here this morning are looking for that right now. You've never experienced it before, but your, your mind, your emotions, your spirit is driving you. If I could have a family somewhere, if I could have a family, well, let me tell you something. We'll welcome you into the family of God this very minute. Into the family, the eternal family that will never, ever end established on Calvary by the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, I was a sinner. Filthy in my sin. And I tried to stop and I tried to quit and I tried to alter and I tried to change and I couldn't do it. And the weight of that sin became too much. And I came to Jesus. And Jesus said, I'll take that sin off of you. I'll cleanse you. 
I'll make you new. And I'll take you and I'll put my spirit in you so that you and I will have continuous 24-hour-a-day fellowship with one another. All you got to do is just talk to me. All you got to do is just think about me. All you got to do is just call on me. I'm always here. And he said, beyond that, I'll put you in with a group of people who've gone through what you've just gone through. That is, they were sinners and they could not save themselves and they came to me and I did the same thing for them that I'm doing for you. They'll love you. They'll be sympathetic. They'll be tenderhearted. They'll be kind-hearted to you. There'll be a harmony because you will share my spirit and my salvation. Oh, glory. Are you here this morning? You want to end the family? Come on. Come today to a father who will never leave you or desert you or abuse you or hurt you. And come to brothers and sisters that will love you. Come to Jesus. Father, in these moments, I pray, Lord, that this would speak to hearts. Use your word to do what only you can do. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Your head's bowed. Right now, would you come? You step out to join this church. How do we join this church? Come right here to me. You say, how do I come to know Jesus Christ as Lord? Come right here to me. Others of you say, I want to just come and get on my face before God. I want to thank him for this family. I want to thank him for his salvation. You just come right here to this altar. Right now, as Kirkwood plays, you come.